Can't be having that. Wow, that was interesting. What yeah, was that from the uh, the Nixon tapes? Yep. Yep. Oh, that was. Did, did people hear that? Did, can you hear that? In uh, that? Hopefully they can. I made sure the sound didn't blow our eardrums out, and you could actually read this the transcript at the same time, so people can go back and kind of look it over. They're not very polite when they're recording. They're like slamming phones down, crap all over the desk. It's just like. No, no, because he recorded so much that you get a lot of uh, background noise with the Nixon tapes all the time. Oh, yeah. I mean, because oh. it's always, apparently it's always on. The tapes are always on going, you know. Oh, I'm sure. And they're big reel to reel, but. Yeah, yeah. Either way, it's audible. You might have to kind of concentrate a little bit here and there, but at least it's not making ears bleed and. Well, we can get it. I, we could give them the gist of what it was. I mean, uh, when the uh, White House heard about the uh, the Wallace shooting, but I think we're going to have to explain who George Wallace is before we even get anywhere else. The to, a lot of people don't know he's a four term four time governor of Alabama. He ran for the Democratic nomination for president on two occasions, and on one occasion as uh, the American Independent Party he was a um, a populist, uh, a pugilist, apparently, <laughs> and a populist. That, that's funny. I didn't know that. But uh, apparently, a boxer and a, uh, and a guy won a few rounds. I mean, a, a brilliant orator. I was telling Eric I'd watched him, uh, George Wallace, on um, uh, Buck, William F. Buckley's firing line, debating Buckley. Buckley's debating him from the conservative point of view. It's really a political oddity because Buckley's. A conservative and he's claiming that wallace is not a conservative which wallace admits he's not that he's a populist and it's very trumpian um anyway it's worth it if you could see the the the, the wallace uh, uh william F. buckley debate uh, you'll get a sense of how sharp smart uh and quick um, um Wallace's. This is not to endorse his politics um, or what was going on down there at the time. It's merely to suggest that Wallace was at the top of his game at this point in his life. And um, you have to understand the numbers of where this is when the shooting occurred. Um, Nixon and McGovern were locked in a dead heat on a merry-go-round at 41% of the vote, according to the Gallup polls at the time, with Wallace pulling in and climbing like a rocket at 18%. Now, the 18%, uh, not unlike today, was coming from um, Republican voters who were crossing over and not from McGovern voters. McGovern was the equivalent of an RFK Jr. at the time. Um, and after the shooting occurs and Wallace is removed from the race, uh, the fact is it becomes one of the largest political landslides in American history, with McGovern winning just one state. Uh, moments before that, in May, uh, it's a dead heat on a merry-go-round, you know, at, eight, at, at 41 and 41. Uh, people don't realize that because of the landslide that occurs after the shooting. So you begin to question as to who benefits from the shooting. Uh, like a lot of these political uh, events, you have to look first at who is the beneficiary, regardless of uh, this shot of McGovern. McGovern was a, a bombardier pilot who may have served under LeMay in World War II. Uh, he was not a guy that was portrayed in the media 
as this uh, hippie guy. He was a World War II bomber um, from South Dakota. Uh, but that being said, a very quiet candidate who didn't have much um, uh, personality, let me just put it that way. Um, good guy who, you know, couldn't carry a bunch of states, but Wallace could. And um, the sentiment in the country at the time, that everywhere we go now, we begin to see, as we do these shows, that Wallace had a lot of political support from independents and from uh, conservatives and from some mainstream Democrats because he was a Democrat. He was a, uh, that was his political party. He was an anti-crime guy too, wasn't he? Because at the time, th th so much was going on. He was like, hey, you shouldn't be afraid to go cash your check uh, in Philadelphia and, and things like that. So he's right, kind of running right. on that. And, and he had gotten hecklers everywhere he went and he gave as good as he got. He had a, a street sense as a street politician and as a, uh, a pugilist, as Eric put up there. He was a fighter. <laughs> this guy was a fighter. And, um, you know, he famously said, you know, stood in the doorway of the uh, of the university and said segregation now, today, segregation, tomorrow, segregation forever, which is um, probably on his tombstone. Um, but nevertheless, uh, the guy was a brilliant politician. And um, in the as Barnes likes to point out, the Southern populist tradition, um, he really was a man of the people and reflecting the sentiment of the time. Whether you agree with that sentiment or not, um, I don't think it's going to take too long for someone in the comment section to write, uh, he got what he deserved. I, uh, of course. Which is gonna, horrible. Of course it's horrible. <laughs> but I, I, yeah. I, I just want to take the power out of it by saying it up front. So some sure. schmuck uh, thinks he's not original when he comes up with it. Um, anyway, to make to make a long story short, he's seeking this nomination and he's crisscrossing the country, Wallace, and he's up in Michigan. He's uh, uh, in Maryland. He's uh, obviously in Wisconsin. He's in, a, he's in a lot of different places. Even Canada, wasn't he? Like no, no, no. He, he didn't go to Canada. He uh, okay. there's, there's a part of the story which we're going to get to. There's no point okay. campaigning in Canada. There, there was a president who goes to Canada. Um, oh, boy. Okay. Did you hear that? Yeah, I lost you. You went completely black. No, I, I had to hang up the phone because the do not disturb is on, but apparently does absolutely nothing. Um, so the 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 Bremer situation is that this is a kid who they say is a lone nut assassin who was a crackpot who wanted to be famous. Here's a picture of him. Uh, I think that's his mugshot because he's got a chain around yeah. his neck. Yeah, yeah. So this guy like oh it's Eric, a mugshot i think this might be an earlier mugshot. yeah shot that's the earlier one he when was he got arrested. for possession when he sat there and waited for them yeah to get he him was or... arrested in his car playing around with a gun and uh you know he was portrayed in the media as a doofus illiterate and uh lone nut who wanted to be famous and um this was the portrayal he was filmed doing the crime and there was a lot of similarities to the sirhan case because there's witnesses, he's a lone guy, he's got a handgun. Uh, this woman who filmed, uh, the guy who filmed it from CBS News, uh, which we're gonna show at some point here, um, also filmed him on two other occasions, Eric, prior to this, I don't know if people realize that. The, the, the Secret Service uh, was there for all of these different events that he shows up at, but to, to go backwards in time to explain well, wait a second. I just want to explain Bremer's childhood a little bit. He's raised in this, um, you know, rundown apartment, and his mother is like a complete whack job, working class parent, south side of Milwaukee, uh, completely dysfunctional household. At one point, she's got to go to children's court for the older brother, and she brings him as a baby into the court and is spanking the, the crap out of him. And the judge from the bench says, obviously, you don't know how to be a mother, ma'am. I you know, suggest you read a few books on how to be a mother and uh, a, a lot of abuse in the family. Wow. It's a lot of abuse. He doesn't go out. He, he stays inside. He hates his mother's guts. He's got a younger brother, an older brother, and uh, didn't have that many friends at school. But 
he does graduate. He, he is a good student. And um, he graduates in January 1969. So the whole country is in turmoil when this guy graduates in 1969. I mean, the whole thing's coming apart. And he briefly attends Milwaukee Technical College where he studies aerial photography, art, writing, psychology, but drops out after a semester. He becomes, and this is kind of interesting, he becomes a um, part-time janitor at the school, um, at the high school, right? So he also gets employed as another part-time job as a busboy at the Milwaukee Athletic Club. Um, and he's kind of sent into the kitchen because people are a little spooked by him. He whistled and marched. And he was like a guy who would, you know, go around the restaurant whistling and marching around. And, you know, he wasn't uh, uh, quiet enough for them. So they put him in the kitchen. But um he uh, quits the job in 1972 and he starts working as a janitor at the Story Elementary School um, where he, in 1971 total, he makes $3,116 according to his federal income tax. Okay, that's his total as a part-time janitor. And in, in, that's in 71. 72, he makes nothing because he, he quits and there's no job in January, February, March. The shooting is May 17th, May, May 15th. So he's obviously has no employment. Now he lives, he moves into a three room, one bedroom apartment near Marquette University. And the reason Marquette's important is Marquette is a Jesuit school. And if you follow our series on the CIA, the Jesuits are linked historically to the CIA. Marquette is a recruiting college for the CIA. There's a lot of turbulent anti-war activity there. Uh, I don't know what this is here. This the is that. Yeah. Okay. They're, yeah. They're all over Marquette and tied in with the CIA and everything else. Right. So this guy, Bremer, begins to attend SDS meetings. And he's there with a bunch of other uh, leftists who are planning and doing different things. And... Uh, some people believe that he might have been exposed to the SDS through their program called Operation Prison Break. And Operation Prison Break was the SDS storming elementary, mostly high schools in various working class areas. And the Weather Underground did this too. The Weathermen also did this. They would take into the classroom, which is kind of what I recommended for the CRT thing uh, with the... Uh, uh, leftist teachers. I, I kind of use that out of the SDS uh, Weather Underground Playbook. What they did was, Eric, was they'd storm into a classroom, take it over, and begin teaching their point of view, the Howard Zinn history of the United States. Uh, they would the hostage, the teacher hostage. It was no weapons. It wasn't, um, you know, a gunpoint. However, it was a violent takeover of the class they did at Evergreen. They did that at Evergreen with Weinstein. Sorry. Now that I think about it, they did that That's at Evergreen with Weinstein. That's right. That's where it came from. Amazing. That's where it came from. Yeah, yeah. That's where they got it. And it, it was called Operation Jailbreak. They said the prison, the, the schools are like jails and we'll break them out. So they would go in there and begin having these uh, teach-ins. And for the most part, the kids were like, yeah, hey, this is crazy. This is great. You know what I mean? Um, but a guy gets beaten up there. And this guy gets beaten up, and his name is Tim Heinen. And Tim Heinen is a student at this school, and he is going to Marquette. And they take over the classroom of Marquette, and they shut it down. And Heinen uh, gets beaten up. Uh, there's a picture of Tim Heinen. Tim Heinen is a student at uh, Marquette University. And Tim Heinen is taken aside by a policeman and says, the policeman says, obviously, you're not politically aligned with these people. And he says, no, I'm not. I, I despise them. And he says, the, the cop says, maybe you can help us. And he recruits Heinen to become an undercover operative for the intelligence division of the Milwaukee Police Department. And that's where this story really starts, because when Heinen goes undercover uh, for the Milwaukee Police Department, he breaks through as an SDS member, obviously faking it, 
he gets into the left of Marquette and he begins to uh, file names to the Milwaukee intelligence uh, uh, unit of who is operating in SDS and uh, the Communist League inside of Marquette. There's a Communist League, there's a Workers' Revolutionary Party, there is the SDS, there are various parties in there. Now, they have people in their parties looking for uh, people like Heinen who are trying to break into it and get intelligence on them. And one of the guys he meets is a guy who um, is involved at a market and the Catholic workers leftist movement. And that guy is working there. Uh, if I could find this guy's name, oh, it's Michael D. Cullen. Michael Cullen is a guy working as a Catholic worker and the Catholic workers had a leftist anti-war uh, wing to it. And this guy, Cullen, uh, was not one of them. He, he was a little bit more violent. Cullen was part of a group called the Milwaukee 14, Eric. And what they did was they went into the draft of the, the, uh, the draft board office and using uh, uh, fire and chemicals destroyed all the draft records in the state of Wisconsin uh, of, of the draft records of people being drafted. And uh, this was heralded by the left as a... Um, incredible attack on the war machine. So Heinen was, uh, gets wind of this, and, and Cullen, Michael Cullen, is part of a group called the Milwaukee 14. Uh, very, it's kind of like uh, uh, Chicago 7, but a regional Chicago 7, Eric, if that makes any sense. The Milwaukee mm -hmm. 14 did this act and other actions to affect the war. Now, they were made up of people of various stripes. And there was a place uh, called the Midget Tavern. Why it was called the Midget Tavern, I don't know. It wasn't filled with midgets. It was just called the, the Midget Tavern. So the Midget Tavern, uh, some bar, and Heinen goes into the bar. And at the bar is two guys drinking a beer, and they're looking at newspapers. The Daily uh, World, I think it was. Not the Daily Work. It was like the Daily World, which is a, a communist newspaper out of Moscow. And the whole paper is dedicated. It's three years old, the newspaper. But it was an edition that the Daily World put out about George Wallace. And the whole thing is about George Wallace. I'm not sure what this is here. Is that the 14? Milwaukee 14, yeah. That's oh, okay. So, there it is. I've never seen that. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Yeah, I thought maybe I made this up in my mind because I remember them vaguely. Um, it wasn't a, a pretty famous group, but they were a regional, a regional type of uh, Chicago 7. So, so dig. So there's people in there like Lori McNally from Kalamazoo. She was in the Communist Young Workers Operation League. And the FBI is infiltrating this stuff left and right. But like, Colin is not even an American. The, the leader of the group is from Ireland. Um, and he's an exchange student at Marquette, which is fine for the CIA and the FBI and everything. But the place is just crawling with intelligence at Marquette. And, and this goes on for decades, by the way. Um, so anyway, so they, he goes to the bar, Heinen, and who does he see at the bar? It's these two guys. And uh, Cohen is explaining to the other guy next to him that you have to be willing to go to jail uh, for the cause. And he said, I went to jail for the cause. You have to be willing to go to jail for the cause. It doesn't matter what it is. We can't trust you unless you go to jail for the cause. And the guy says, all right, whatever the cause is, I'll go to jail for it, right? So they're looking at the newspaper. They get up and they go to the bathroom because the cop comes in. And who's the other guy at the bar with Cullen? It's Arthur Bremer. Bremer is now a protege of Cullen. Cullen has taken him under his wing to teach him how to be good Marxist revolutionary. And the arrest, the arrest that you're talking about with um, Bremer is Bremer parking his car, no parking zone. He takes out his gun and his ammo, sits in front of a synagogue and has everything exposed. And a cop comes by and says, what are you doing? He goes, I don't know. And he, what are you doing with that gun? There's bullets in there. He goes, I don't know. So he's arrested. And the judge gives him a mental examination, which he kind of passes and reduces the charges to a misdemeanor, fines him $38, but he gets the arrest. And now there he is allowed to be part of the boys club and a couple of girls, actually, you know, 
and they begin Can you to check your Wi-Fi signal? get a because handler you around. Yeah, you completely froze now. Can you check your Wi-Fi but... signal? Um, because it's stuttering really badly. Hopefully, it How comes would I do now. That? Um, okay, uh, it's calm right now. Um, we might have to know. switch you to LTE. But all right, well let's LTE. keep going. See. Okay, so yeah. So anyway, he um, is now part of this group, Arthur Bremer, around Marquette University. He pleaded guilty to, to disorderly conduct. And um, he has gone into a gun shop to buy this gun, the Casanova gun shop, which is um, in Milwaukee. He buys a charter arms undercover 38 to replace the one that was taken by the cops. And he'll buy a couple other guns as the story goes on. So Bremer um, begins to try to find a target for his actions that he's come up with and or has been assigned. One of the guys overseeing him now is a cat named Dennis Cassini. Now, Dennis Cassini may be CIA, may be uh, part of the leftist group. He goes to Cuba at one point, Dennis Cassini. He's 220 pounds, six foot four, big, wavy, longish hair, uh, dark. He looks like he's from uh, Italy. Uh, he might be Italian, might be Spanish. No one really knows. He's seen on a uh, ferry boat um, with um, Bremer going across with his car from Michigan, at the uh, crossing one of the, um, the the little bodies of water there, and he's identified by the guy who runs the uh, railroad crossing there with the with the cars. But Cassini may or may not be uh, CIA. We don't really know. His, his, his legend is that he's a revolutionary underground leader of a Marxist revolutionary group, Cassini. But that may be a cover. That may be a cover. That was never ever determined as to what Cassini's real legend is. I'm going to get back to Cassini a little later. Because right now, um, caused by unstable internet connection. Am I frozen or no? Yep, yeah, I can hear you. You good? keep freezing, but we'll, we'll just keep going with the sound. I could not find a picture of Dennis Cassini. I did look um, all over for it. No, nobody um, can. Don't worry about it. It, it is the hardest photo in, in the world. The only ones that have a photo of Dennis Cassini is um, the FBI, and they wouldn't give it up to the Washington Post, they wouldn't give it up to uh, the New York Times. So don't cry, Eric. Ooh. Kind of makes you wonder if he might be a three-letter guy. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't really know. But Bremer begins to decide that he's going to do something with their recommendations, and he um, decides to kill the president. And you go, well, that's, that's bold. You're going to kill the president. He begins to, this has nothing to do with George Wallace, he begins to uh, go after Richard Nixon, the president of the United States. And he's, Nixon goes, oh, if Bremer is following me, if Bremer is on my tail, I'm a dead man. Because nobody will stop Arthur Bremer. I can tell you that right now. Uh, anyway, so Bremer goes around the country stalking Richard Nixon, who's running for re-election. That will take Richard Nixon up to Ottawa, Canada, not for the re-election, wow. but for a official parliamentary meeting with Canadian officials. Uh, he goes to a white uh, dinner, white tie dinner event. He goes to the parliament and um, the security is extremely tight because there was an incident the year before, if I remember, with Kosygin, the premier of the Soviet Union. There was some sort of attempt on his life up there. Uh, I don't remember the exact details of that, but the security is very tight on Nixon when he goes up to Canada. Now, who goes up to Canada is, is Arthur Bremer. And Arthur Bremer will first attempt to get Nixon in New York. And you say, well, I mean, this guy, he, he's a janitor. You know what I mean? He, he's, he's a part-time janitor, Eric. I mean, how could he be doing all this stuff, goes to New York, right? So, okay, so Dick, he... he flies to New York to kill Nixon, right? So before that, he buys uh, two more guns. One is a 14-shot semi-automatic, um, I forget which kind of gun this is. He buys three guns, 
Uh, one of them is this Charter 38. Another one is is uh, a 22, and then he buys this 14 shot uh, semi-automatic. So, <laughs> which is funny, I'll tell you why. Because he's on the plane, he gets off on the plane, and he's in the men's room, and he hears his name being paged, and it's the pilot for the plane who gives him back his guns. He left him on the plane. So, you know, I guess it was okay <laughs> back in the day to fly around like that. <laughs> but anyway, so he, he flies to New York, and you say, well, how is this guy possibly flying around to um, kill Nixon? You know what I mean? Like, Eric, how is this possible that a guy could do this, you know, on a janitor salary, on a janitor salary? Right. Now, he made three thousand dollars. He made what three thousand dollars in that year? Oh, over like fourteen hundred of it was in rent, paid out, and yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, there's food, there's rent. There's, he made three thousand one hundred sixteen dollars the year before as a part-time janitor and as a busboy. Okay, that's his total. His mother has to make him sandwiches. The family lives on welfare. They've been on welfare for years. The father, to his credit. Uh, is a drunk, but he's a truck driver. I think he separates from the family. He's a truck driver, and when he has another job, and he takes his son to the other job, uh, this is Arthur, he takes his son to the other job when he comes back from the truck driving job. And the other job, I found out, was selling beer at the Milwaukee Brewers County Fult Fulton County Stadium. I wish my dad sold beer at Dodger Stadium. I would have gone every day with him. So Arthur goes with his dad to sell beer at County Stadium for the Brewers. Interestingly enough, a little tidbit of information. He, he, he meets a girl while he's a janitor named Joan Pemich. And Joan is 15 years old, this little blonde. And here she is. She's 15 years old. Don't be confused by those Coke bottle glasses. Uh, yeah, there's <laughs> a better shot of her waiting, waiting for Arthur to come over. He's 21. She's 15. She's like a hall monitor at the school where he is a janitor. And they talk in the hall every day. They get into a, a heated romantic thing and they become a couple. Now you say, well, what could they do? Well, I, I found out he took her to see Blood, Sweat, and Tears. And I went, dude, I love Blood, Sweat, and Tears. I wish I could have gone with Arthur Bremer to see Blood, Sweat, and Tears. I, it, the funny thing about Arthur Bremer, as opposed to the other assassins, is he's contemporary. And mm -hmm. he goes to see A Clockwork Orange. He goes to see uh, different movies and reviews them in his diary. The diary, by the way, is absolutely riveting. I was talking to Eric before. The front half of the diary is missing. The diary that we have, which is Arthur Bremer's diary, was found in his car immediately after the Wallace shooting. But that's 148, begins at page 148. The first part of the diary uh, has never been published. And I don't know the reason for that. And I'm looking into it, trying to find it. Uh, it was found in 1980 by a construction worker. Uh, Bremer had put it in a viaduct in yeah, Milwaukee. Yeah, he hid it, wrapped it, and he had it, plastic. And, become... and he refers to it in the other diary. He refers to that. Yeah, and he even said I... my first 148 pages or, or something, and I, it was very weird. Gore Vidal called him one of the best writers he's ever seen. Gore Vidal reviewed the diary for the New York Times <laughs> Review of Books, and he said, this was no busboy who wrote this diary. They started to compare him to Kerouac, to Hunter Thompson. Dude, the, oh, yes, oh, yes. And what Gore Vidal does is he believes that E. Howard Hunt wrote the diary. We'll get into that in a, in a second. Hunt would later become a novelist. And he says there's misspellings in here in the diary that seem almost intentional, that he was an A student in grammar in school. He knew how to spell these words. There was no way he misspelled these words that are in the uh, diary. And sometimes he spells them right. Other times he comments on his misspellings, almost as if someone wrote it for him and mm. or gave it to him or said it was from him. And I'm going to tell you why that's important in a couple of minutes. But his romance with the girl, um, Joan, is kind of cut off by the mom. He goes over there for Christmas. They go on a number of dates. 
um, takes her to see Blood, Sweat, and Tears. You know, it's a contemporary couple in 1970, um, as contemporary as you could be. I mean, I thought I could have been reading the diary of one of my own classmates or myself when you read this stuff. I mean, as he's stalking Nixon, he goes to see a Clockwork Orange and gives a full review in the, in the diary. He's seen Kubrick movies. He's, he's read Moby Dick. He goes to see an Otto Preminger film uh, and reviews that in the, mo in the book. I mean, it, it's, hmm. it's, he, he's so far above these other lone nut assassins. You know, when, 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 when uh, the writer, Paul Schrader of Taxi Driver, Paul Schrader insists that he didn't read the diary till after the movie came out. I think he's full of shit. Uh, there's too many similarities between the De Niro character of Travis Bickle and and uh, um, uh, Arthur Bremer. It's just ridiculous. And he has a voiceover that's from a diary type thing that that Bickle has written. Um, there is Bremer on the left. I don't know. The second one is Schrader. Oh, Schrader. Yeah. yeah. And there's Hinckley on the right. Yeah. So they got this meta thing going on. I mean, just to digress for, for a while. The, you see, he's wearing, they're wearing the same buttons, basically. You know, De Niro, the, the Bickle character, um, wants to be seen. And that's what, what Bremer was doing. Bremer would go, as is what Bickle does in the movie, he chats up the Secret Service. He chats up the Secret Service. He's staying at the Elgin Hotel in Ottawa. Uh, and Aviva sees this. The Elgin Hotel is the Waldorf Astoria of Ottawa. He's staying in the hotel with 36 Secret Service agents, for Christ's sakes. You know what I mean? So just to get this, Hinkley, if you go back for a second, because I just want to share this with people, the, the meta, the meta, meta, meta of this crazy story. Bremner's diary, uh, Paul Schrader says he created Bickle, but he didn't really know that much about it. I mean, that's played by De Niro, does Taxi Driver, has Jodie Foster in it, who's kind of a Joan Permich character, a young underage girl that's the love interest of, De Niro, of, of Travis Bickle. That's the same as Joan, Joan Permich. Uh, who is the love interest of Arthur Bremer. Now, John Hinckley on the right, the love interest for him, becomes Jodie Foster from the movie Taxi Driver, and he begins calling her at Yale University in the dorm where she mocks him with her girlfriends, exacerbating uh, John Hinckley's situation. Now, Hinckley, <laughs> John Hinckley, will shoot Ronald Reagan after his brother had was supposed to have dinner that with Neil Bush that night. Now, Hinckley's brother had had various interactions with Neil Bush, the son of uh, Vice President George Herbert Walker Bush. And if Hinckley had been successful, he would have been a uh, 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 George Herbert Walker Bush would have been a Lyndon Johnson. So Hinckley's relationship through the oil industry, his father, John Hinckley Sr., was in the oil business, as were the Bushes, and there were family ties up the kazoo. Neil Bush was supposed to have dinner with John Hinckley uh, that night with John Hinckley's uh, 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 brother. And, uh, you know, the shooting happens that night. So Neil Bush calls off that dinner. But they had met previously for other dinners. So don't, don't be deceived by that spin by the Bush family. But the, the meta stuff on this is when when Hinckley shoots Reagan, guess what he's got uh, on his person? The Arthur Bremer diary, for Christ's sakes. This goes full circle, Hunley. Yeah, that's, a, that's what I was saying. It's literally um, art imitating life with life imitating the art that imitated life. Right. It, it's an absolute perfect weird circle. Well, it gets even better because William Brenner, who's his brother, gets arrested after the assassination a month afterwards for uh, defrauding fat women on a diet uh, treatment for $80,000 in like 1973 money. And he's arrested and he's defended the guy up in Milwaukee, right? This is his brother, comes from a working class impoverished family. He gets arrested for fraud for embezzling this money from fat women. And he's defended by Ellis Rubin. You go, well, Ellis Rubin. Who's Ellis Rubin? Ellis Rubin is the Watergate attorney who defended the uh, Cubans in Watergate. Okay. <laughs> Just to get that, that part out. Now, he has a sister. Um, his sister, uh, Gail, 
this is the Bremer's sister. Uh, she was tied into a guy named Reverend Jerry Owen. And Reverend Jerry Owen was a guy who said that he had picked up Sirhan Sirhan as a hitchhiker in L.A., okay? And the FBI was investigating all of this stuff, and it turns out that moments after the shooting, the secretary of a man in L.A. got a phone call saying that Wallace had been shot. The secretary of the man said this because she answered the phone, and that man was William J. Bryan, the junior, the hypnotist of Sirhan. Uh, Brian gets a phone call in L.A. Uh, moments after the shooting, according to a secretary, uh, from someone who calls him that that uh, Wallace has been shot. Because there's rumors to the effect that Bremer is another MK Ultra hypnotized uh, patsy. Uh, the bullets that he shoots into Wallace do not match the uh, bullets from the gun. Nobody can match it when he is treated for head injuries. Uh, being smacked around after the assassination, the doctor washes his hands, washes Bremer's hands with industrial medical soap and water, and he fails the nitrate test of having shot a gun. Okay, this is him being taken right after the assassination attempt. It's almost as if it was a, uh, a planned theatrical event, right? He almost looks like he, he's being uh, cradled it, in that shot. Yeah, 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 it's it's yeah, yeah, a yeah. comforting shot. And it's a very weird one. Right. I mean, they do the paraffin test. It turns out negative right after the shooting. I mean, he's got a handgun in his hand, shooting five shots, injures three other people, including the Secret Service agent, including the state trooper who was the personal bodyguard for George Wallace, and including a woman bystander. All of them will survive, uh, including uh, George Wallace, obviously. He takes it multiple shots into the stomach and none of the angles of the bullets line up. It's really crazy. When you look at the Time magazine and New York Times uh, drawings of the assassination, um, nothing lines up. It's really, really creepy. Now, the, the, the video you're going to show right now, show the actual shooting and the, the Lawrence, I forgot the guy's last name. He was... Um, cameraman for CBS News. Now, he films the assassination attempt uh, in color, but he also said that he filmed he filmed uh, Bremer three times during the in other towns. Thinking yeah, he did, this uh, guy was a weirdo and needed to be filmed. Uh, well, uh, Pierce, Lawrence Pierce. In here. Um, At the yeah, first, this is this Bremer, is a news camera morning, focused morning, on a familiar figure yeah, this is that dressed in red, white, and blue. This is the event before. Arthur Bremer, standing close to the stage, asked one of the men guarding you Wallace, there, could you get George to come down and shake hands with me? But Wallace never mixed with the mostly hostile out. I mean, crowd. Everybody commented Instead, that he, he and his out. entourage pushed on Wherever he went. to Laurel, Maryland. Anyway, that was the uh, the event that morning, and then you have the actual event here. Right. So this this is the uh, the same photographer or camera person who filmed the assassination. And um, you know, if you're the press, you begin to see the same people all the time. So they all saw Bremer. Bremer wore just you know, American flag socks, an American flag shirt, an American flag. A tie, not around his collar, but around his neck, under his shirt, a, a blue blazer, black pants, and a big button saying, I'm a Republican. Uh, sometimes it said, I'm a Republican. Sometimes it said, I'm George Wallace, the border. Um, yep. And they, they got to recognize him after a while. Oh, well, as a matter of fact, that morning, by the way, he asked, hey, can you have George come down and shake our hands of the Secret Service? Remember how he was interacting? He actually was asking oh, yeah. them that that morning. Yeah. Um, this right here is going well, into it. Well, there's dozens of, of, of mystic. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, this right here is yeah, okay. when so he not, went it, into the crowd you know, and the Secret Service is like, hey, hey, uh, don't do that. He said, oh, I, I'll, I'll be fine. I'll take the liability. Oh, right. That is right. That is true. That is true. He uh, does go into the crowd. Now, there's a guy who, this is, you can't make this up. There's a guy in a brand new blue Cadillac who escapes and they put out an APB for the guy in the blue Cadillac. Yeah, look at that. Yeah, yeah, 
Now, I'm doing this in, silently to um, deal with YouTube issues. His wife really was all over him, though. That's really. Cornelia Wallace. She will become the governor of the great state of Alabama uh, pretty shortly after this, uh, the woman governor of the, of the state of Alabama. Um, she believed there was a conspiracy. Uh, Wallace believed there was a conspiracy. Wallace believed the Nixon administration uh, hired Bremer to the day he died. Um, he would later become a born-again Christian. He will forgive Bremer. He will constantly write letters to Bremer, uh, wanting to meet with him to forgive him for his crimes. And uh, he was in pain uh, for the rest of his life. He was in a wheelchair. He was taken out of the campaign at that point. And Nixon won by a landslide. Now, I just want to get back to the, the hunting of Nixon, because this happens before this. And this is why this is so important. Bremer flies to LaGuardia, right? He gets to LaGuardia and um, he wants to go to Wall Street. Oh, before he gets to LaGuardia, he walks around Jamaica uh, in some old uh, bad neighborhoods of Jamaica in Queens. Then he wants to go to Wall Street, Eric. So how does he get to Wall Street, right? He uh, takes a helicopter. Right. So he's in a helicopter. This is a lone assassin who is a um, uh, impoverished um, uh, uh, guy who janitor. Uh, so he takes a helicopter to Wall Street and now he's got to go to a um, hotel. So he rents a limousine and has a chauffeur driver take him to his hotel, which is, of course, uh, the Waldorf Astoria, the most exclusive hotel in the United States. So he just shut up. You will learn the truth here, Hanley. He stays at the Waldorf Astoria in New York for two nights, uh, the best hotel in the world. This is a you know janitor who's a lone nut assassin uh, with no money who made three thousand dollars in 1971. Okay, he's not done. He now goes to the Fifth Avenue Hotel, uh, which has a bar uh, called One Fifth, where I used to drink with celebrities and weirdos. Um, like Kurt Vonnegut and others in the 80s when uh, it's on the end of 9th Street, when 9th Street meets its fifth, there's a bar there in the hotel called One Fifth, the Fifth Avenue Hotel. So Bremer stays at that hotel on Fifth Avenue um, and 9th Street, um, goes to the, after that, he goes to try to uh, get Humphrey, who was staying at the Waldorf Astoria, which is why he went to the Waldorf. But he has a chauffeur limousine, which most assassins do, as you're well aware. Most, most assassins have chauffeur limousines, helicopters, and planes taking them around the country. No one knows to this day, no one knows to this day where that money came from. He buys, before he gets into the chauffeur limousine, he buys a 1967 Rambler Rebel muscle car for the equivalent eight thousand dollars pays cash gets this muscle car and he's driving around the country trying to get nixon in the muscle car and that the muscle car he actually takes into canada here's a picture of the uh amc rambler uh rebel um which is a great sled i mean it's kind of the amc muscle car i guess 1967 that's Kind of when you leave it in a bad neighborhood, that's what happens. You come out in the morning. No, that's right? when the cops. That's when the cops go through it after the fact. <laughs> he took the nine millimeter and he put it in that trunk to hide it from the customs people in Canada. The nine millimeter, and he like, and it goes into some sort of spot in the trunk where he can't get it, and he's worried that it's going to rain and ruin the gun, and he never recovers that gun. Um, he is upset that the Canadian border people don't check his trunk after all the paranoia and stuff he did to avoid being caught with the guns. He's now angry that the guns are not, and they don't even check his trunk. He's going, come on through, let's go. And he's going, don't you want to check? And they go, no, no, come on in. You look all right. You know, so they let him in without even looking in the trunk. That gun's not recovered. The 38, the guns that he buys, he buys them brand new. And he, one of them is 90 and 90. 150. The, 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 this is multiply those numbers by about seven, Eric, to get to today's prices for those guns. The $90 gun would be about $600 today. These are brand new weapons that he's purchased with money. He also has a police scanner radio, high powered binoculars. He has a uh, tape recorder. He's got um, uh, 
some sort of seismic graphic machine in there. Uh, he's got modern devices in the car that were super expensive and no one knows how he got those. Uh, now, keep in mind, this is a guy who may or may not have gotten money from a slush fund for the committee to reelect the president from a guy named William Oswald Mills. And you say, well, who is Oswald, William Oswald Mills? Why does he have Oswald in the middle of his name? William Oswald Mills was a Republican congressman from Maryland, Eric, not too far from where you are, uh, who was a bag man for the Nixon administration, distributing the money from creep to uh, various dirty tricks operations. And after this happened, um, Mills went out and uh, took a shotgun and did this to his head and was found next to his mm. horse stable in Maryland, uh, apparently with the money gone. They believe that he might have been the one who passed $15,000 in cash to Arthur Bremer, and they were closing in on him. And that's why he decided to take that way out. Now, I, I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that's not true. Uh, the reality of it is the guy who escaped in the blue Cadillac was seen changing the license plates 10 miles down the road from Georgia, from Maryland, Georgia uh, plates. And he fit the description perfectly to a T of the big burly CIA guy, Dennis Cassini. This, can't make this up. Cassini is now being sought after by our friend in Milwaukee, uh, Tim Heinen, that we mentioned earlier in the show. Heinen and another uh, journalist are on the trail of Cassini, which they find Cassini. They find Cassini in Toronto. Uh, I can't know who this is here. That's Heinen and the author he was working with, or the journalist he was working with. Oh, Stang. Spag yeah, that's Stang. Stang, Stang. Stang and yeah. Heinen yeah, and, uh, and, yeah. a, and a congressman. Right. Okay, so they find Cassini, and they find him up in Toronto. Unfortunately for them, Cassini's dead. And Cassini has died of a heroin overdose, which is odd, because he didn't do heroin, he didn't do drugs. In fact, as a member of the SDS, Cassini would stand up in the middle of the meeting saying, we don't need the heat on us from the DEA. Do not do drugs if you're in this organization. We don't need any more aggravation or drug busts. They find Cassini's body... Uh, in Toronto in a hotel from an overdose of heroin. Three guys show up from the CIA to claim the body. That's been fairly well established. The CIA took his body away. But on that body was a, 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 a phone book. And the phone book had a list of names that was recovered at the hotel. And that phone book had names of different revolutionary people around the country that Cassini was either part of legitimately or working for the CIA to infiltrate. It's never been determined uh, what the role is of Cassini. Cassini had been in Cuba. He worked with the Cubans down there. Uh, he is a, a, uh, a guy that we may never know the role of Cassini, but Cassini is definitely linked to Arthur Bremer. Arthur Bremer told his employer and told everyone in school, going back to the senior year in high school, I am a communist. This is Arthur Bremer saying it, whether he's crazy or not. You know, Hitler and Stalin were crazy. It didn't make them not communists and not fascists. So Arthur Bremer, when he stood trial, uh, was declared as sane as could be and might have been a schizoid type personality. One of the problems with his trial, which lasted about five minutes, is his trial started August 31st. Or it, was ended, it started the July 31st, and by August 4th, he was convicted. It lasted four days, the trial. Uh, his attorney stood up and said for his defense, I got a great idea. I'm going to read the Arthur Bremer diary out loud. <laughs> and everybody went, that's the greatest writing we've ever heard, Hunley. <laughs> so the diary, the jury says afterwards, we had our doubts about his sanity until his, his attorney read the diary. And we went, the guy's totally sane. He's a great writer. And in fact, he is. As Gore Vidal said, he's a great writer. Gotta love it. <laughs> anyway, he's convicted immediately uh, 10 years uh, for the three people, uh, 35 years for Wallace, and he is sent away to a prison in Maryland, right? 
And um, before the trial happens, the FBI shows up at his apartment in Milwaukee and they look around and they go, all right, we'll be back. So they don't secure the apartment. They don't secure the apartment. Just, just so you know, they don't secure the apartment. They leave the FBI. The FBI shows up at the apartment. Who's in the apartment? The Secret Service. They both take out their guns and they're going to shoot each other. There's a standoff. I swear to God, a standoff with guns drawn, guns drawn between the FBI and the Secret Service. The FBI wants to control the apartment. Secret Service says we're in charge here. It comes literally down to drawn guns. Okay. The FBI says we'll be back. So they leave. Secret Service leaves. They leave the apartment wide open. The landlady begins to charge $10 to anyone who wants to come in and rifle through the apartment. So everyone shows up. <laughs> no, no, you can't make this up. Everyone shows up from Marquette University and begins taking everything out of the apartment. They take photos of themselves. They're stealing stuff. Going, hey, look at this. Here's this Playboy magazine collection. Let's take this. They, they rifle through the apartment. They take selfies of their day in the apartment. And who comes back after an hour and a half? FBI. They go, all right. FBI is here. Everybody freeze. So the FBI now begins to uh, search for evidence. Swear to God. FBI takes some stuff, boxes, whatever they do. And that's the end of the investigation of the FBI. But the FBI goes around and intimidates everyone, saying, don't talk to anybody. It's a typical thing. Don't talk to the press. They go to this guy, Nunnery, um, who who is one of the guys who identified Cassini, one of the guys who uh, uh, Bremer told was a communist. And they tell uh, Nunnery, who's a tough guy, uh, and his wife, they tell him not to talk about what you learned. And he, go, they tell him, he tells them to go F themselves, right, to the FBI, right to their face. Uh, sounds like today. So the FBI says, well, we'll destroy you. And they go to his neighbors and begin to tell his neighbors that he's an alcoholic with uh, delusions and visions. Right. This is what Nunnery tells the press later. And the FBI tries to destroy Nunnery for identifying both Bremer and his handler, uh, who is Cassini, and also Michael Cullen, who I pointed out earlier. I think Michael Cullen might have been the George de Morinschild and Cassini might have been the Ruth Payne, if that makes any sense uh, in hmm. this story. Now, don't forget, you got his brother who's got the attorney from Watergate even though he's just some schlub. <laughs> he's just some Jack Ruby schlub who lives in, a, in the apartment with, uh, uh, with his mother who disappears to Chicago every weekend to play the horses. This is Arthur Bremer's mother, by the way. Uh, so that's kind of weird. Crazy. So anyway, so the FBI says nothing happened here and they begin to circle the wagons. Now, getting back to the Nixon administration, we have these tapes that you were alluding to. The tapes are Nixon telling Charles Colson uh, through Haldeman and Ehrlichman to send somebody up uh, like G. Gordon Liddy, if you want to see the episode on Liddy, maybe there's a little bit in there about that, uh, or Hunt. Now, Hunt is CIA, uh, Liddy is plumber's unit, so I always presumed it was Liddy. They, Nixon says, if uh, just to translate what Nixon was talking about, they're going to blame the right wing for this. Let's get out in front of the story and plant it that it's a left wing assassination because I've heard this guy's a commie anyway. OK, so Nixon says, why don't we get a guy up there? And it might have been Segretti. It might have been Liddy. It might have been Hunt. But somebody goes to that apartment and, and in this chaos is told to disperse and plant literature from the George McGovern political campaign. Um, now, I don't know if, if he would have killed McGovern or not. He apparently didn't care who he was going to kill because he seemed to be in such a state of hypnosis. Uh, by the way, that guy I mentioned, Michael Cullen, the Irish guy um, who was um, part of the Catholic worker movement from Marquette, master hypnotist, Huntley. Hmm. Master hypnotist. Michael Cohen. Uh, so he might have been, the, you know, the hypnotist guy uh, for Bremer, who always had that bizarre smirk on his face. And in the trial of Bremer, he was turning around and sticking his tongue out at the audience and taunting them. And then when the verdict finally came in, it's the only time the smirk ever ended. He's smirking during the shooting. He's smirking as he's stalking him. He's working him all through New York. 
he goes he goes to a place called the Victorian, which is a bordello on Lexington Avenue when he's chasing Nixon. And he goes in there and um, he wants to have sex with the girl, but it's a massage place and he can't convince her to have sex with him. And he, he gets a failed uh, hand operation um, and that doesn't work. And he gives her a $30 tip, which is the equivalent of giving her a $210 tip for something that didn't occur. So he hmm. said, look, I didn't get off would you mind giving me back my money and she said no this is what i do so he gets into a fight with her not unlike what happens with travis bickle where he goes in uh with iris into that bordello where um you know harvey Keitel is out front as matthew the pimp if people remember the movie uh he goes a little bit down the street in the east village and goes into apartment building goes up the top floor where it is a bordello uh, not unlike the situation that Bremer went into on Lexington Avenue in New York. So all of this is in his diary. And the diary is such, he's hes funny. He's got black comedy in there. He's got tons of self-deprecating humor. He writes well. Like I said to Eric before the show, it seems like the uh, misspellings are intentional on somebody's part. And because he had an A in English when he was in school. Uh, this is an odd case, my friends. This is a, a very odd case. And, uh, you know, I've known about this case for many years, and it's kind of like the Sirhan case, where everybody thought it was just an open and closed case uh, because of the filming of the shooting. Um, mm-hmm. I think they would have filmed the Sirhan one if they could. But this one, they were following him outside, and it was easy to film, you know. He had a friend, his closest friend was a kid named Thomas Newman in high school, um, uh, Bremer. And the year before this happened, um, Thomas Newman was playing Russian roulette in front of his sister. And a thing happened, Hunley, that we can't discuss that uh, Hmm. really affected Arthur Bremer uh, with gun stuff, you know, where uh, Russian roulette happened. Yeah, I hate it when you lose. Mm Mm-hmm. Terrible, terrible gamble. But <clears throat> interesting. Well, on his diary, I put anyway, so the diary. In, in his diary, Nichols. yeah, the diary, um, he talks about Sirhan. <laughs> and he's, uh, I mean, it's so meta. He's talking about Sirhan in the diary. And a couple of days before he shoots Wallace, he goes to the library and he takes out a couple of books out of the library. Oh, by the way, this is the movie pick of the week here. Taxi Driver. Uh, He goes to the library, takes out two books. One of them is RFK Must Die by uh, uh, Kaiser, Robert Kaiser. It's a great book. Um, Kaiser was obviously in on it. Uh, He he was a magazine writer who got a book deal out of Sirhan to do this book that the money would go to his defense and uh, wrote a book. It's a pretty good conspiracy book. It's called RFK Must Die. It's a book I highly recommend. This book was written by an, a Muslim, a Arab uh, activist named Shihab, and it's called Sirhan. A thin book saying that uh, uh, Sirhan was a Arab revolutionary, and that's why he killed RFK. So that book's not so good. It's just a polemic. The other book's great. Um, but anyway, the point, the only reason I mention this is Arthur Bremer took those two books out of the library the week before he shot George Wallace. He decides that Nixon can't be gotten because the Secret Service is too tight. When he goes up to Ottawa, he can't, he can't do it. He can't. It's just too much. It's a presidential security group, um, as opposed to Wallace, who has a couple of Secret Service agents, Eric. You know what I mean? But he can't penetrate the Nixon thing. And that's why he switches to Wallace. And in fact, humorously, he says, I'm going to kill this guy, George Wallace. Nobody in Russia is even going to know who he is. And it's not going to it's not even going to be on the front page. If this and he's saying this humorously, um, there's not much narcissistic tone to the diary. Uh, it's much more matter of fact, much more humor, uh, self-deprecating at times. He's in, he's in the Howard Johnson's hotel, and I, I think it's in Michigan, 
and he takes his gun and he's playing around with it and he shoots the gun accidentally goes off burying the shell through his mattress into the floor and he's waiting for the police to arrive and nothing happens he puts on the tv and he says uh thank god this this war picture is on he turns up the volume and it's the Japs being killed by the Americans in a World War II picture. And he goes, the Japs were giving it to us pretty good until we turned them. Thank God there was a ton of gunfire, so I didn't get arrested for shooting a gun off in the hotel. Wow. Yeah. Crazy. And he's trying to dig the bullet out of the mattress. I mean, there's a certain element of this with of the gang that couldn't shoot straight in terms of Bremer. You know, to come that close to Wallace, put five shots into him, and he's still alive. You know, you got to go to the Jack Ruby School of Assassination and find out how to do this. Well, also, if you watch the footage, it's actually a very impressive set of shots. To be in that yeah. kind of crowd, to tuck it through, to get all five rounds to actually hit Wallace... You know, it seems like oh, it's well, he goes, to close, he but repeatedly. Look how look yeah, at the gun. that's his gun. That's so, the crap. That that's the gun that he used. That's the thirty-eight. Um, that's a thirty-eight snub nose. He also got fourteen-shot uh, Browning pistol. Is the one I was thinking of. Uh, that's the Charter's uh, thirty-eight snub nose uh, police special. But he goes to a gun range with this repeatedly, and a cop comes over and says, "What are you doing?" And he says, "I don't know. I can't hit anything." And he misses the target in a gun range by miles. And the guy says, you can't shoot that far with this gun. And he goes, what do I got to do? He goes, you got to get a gun with a longer barrel, kid. So the cop, <laughs> a month before or weeks before, the cop is trying to give him advice to get a bigger uh, gun with a longer barrel. But it's enough because he's going to work up close uh, doing the handshake routine that we saw with McKinley, right, Eric? Mm-hmm. It's mm -hmm. similar to the McKinley assassination. You know, the phony shake my hand. You know, the, 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 the diary ends with the, the phrase that he was going to say to Wallace when he shot him, which was a penny for a penny for your thoughts, sir. That's how the diary mm -hmm. ends. He doesn't say that in real life. He says, uh, uh, Governor Wallace, can you shake my hand? And Wallace turns and that's when he pumps the five shells into him, you know. Um, but he forgot to say it, uh, Penny B. Thoughts. But the reality of it is, when he, he, in the diary, he talks about trying to find a bordello in New York. So what does he do? He picks up Al Goldstein's Screw Magazine. Now, Al Goldstein used to take us to lunch when we were editors at National Lampoon, because Ratso loved Al Goldstein, and we didn't really care about Al Goldstein. He was kind of like the Harvey Weinstein of his time. So he would pick us up in a limo and he would take us to a restaurant called Big Wong's down in Chinatown, Al Goldstein. This is a little side story. But Al Goldstein published Screw Magazine. So Arthur Bremer picks up Screw Magazine to find a bordello. Uh, and that's where he ends up giving this, this girl a, a $210 tip for a, a failed uh, hand operation. But anyway, and it's just a lot of weird hijinks because somehow this guy had enough money to burn where he was buying cars, going to the Waldorf Astoria, staying at the Elgin Hotel in Ottawa, the Fifth Avenue Hotel, helicopter. Dude, I've never had a helicopter flight from LaGuardia to, to Wall Street. That's insane. I mean, who, who does that, Eric? Who does that? Uh, but, uh, hold on, Mark. Tom Taylor says he saved his money. That's how he did it. Oh, right, right, right. He had, his, he had his savings. I was looking right, to see what happened yeah. with Tom Taylor, if he wound up in the FBI or what happened to him. But um, Tom Taylor. Right. Yeah, that's a stretch. <laughs> that's a stretch. He's drinking Manhattans all the way, by the way. He's going into nightclubs and drinking Manhattans. It's all in the diary. It's, I mean, it, it's, it's really what happens is this. This guy contacts him in prison. He goes up to the glass. It's a guy from, I think, like Esquire magazine or whoever published the book, whatever editor of a major magazine that published the book of the diary in 1973. He goes into prison and he goes to the glass where he's meeting Arthur Bremer and he puts up on the glass for the, for the book deal, $10,000 in advance, 10% royalty, right? 
And Bremer, who he said, oh, maybe he's crazy. Maybe he's not. I don't know. He puts $10,000, 10% royalty. Bremer takes his pad and writes $12,000, 12% royalty and holds it up to the screen. And the guy says, I can tell you right now, Bremer was crazy because that's the deal we signed with him for the Bremer diary. And that's the book deal that Bremer got. Uh, $12,000, uh, which would be the equivalent, let's say, of $120,000 today, 12% royalty, 1972, 73. Uh, that's his property. Now you say, well, what could have happened to Bremer? Like where, where could this guy have gone to? So he does about 36 years in jail and it goes in immediately. 2000, he comes up to parole uh, 1996. He's turned down for parole in 96. 2007, a Democratic liberal governor of Maryland agrees with the statement, apparently, from Bremer. The, the, keep in mind the Sirhan parole hearing that I went to. Uh, Bremer goes to this parole hearing and says, look, I shot a segregationist, racist governor. It wasn't like I shot a regular politician. And apparently the governor of Maryland agreed with him and paroled him based on that statement at the parole hearing. Where, you, where they've been dragging Serhan's ass for 20 parole hearings, trying to get him to express remorse. This guy says, yeah, I shot a segregationist. Let me out. Right. And he says, I want you to take. Um, he also says, I want you to take the Confederate flag off the state uh, sign of Alabama. He says, I'm getting a lot of heat for that. It's almost like I was lynched down there, boys. This is what he's saying in his parole hearing. So the governor of Maryland says, OK. So one day in 2007, six federal black cars roll up to the prison where he is, and he gets out of prison. This, is, this doesn't happen to regular people. He's given a six-car motorcade, Eric, out of this prison in Maryland to Cumberland, Maryland, where he lives to this day right now. And Cumberland, Maryland is a little over an hour away uh, from a place called Langley, the CIA headquarters, which is a little more than an hour and a half away from a place where a man named Hinckley lives. So both of these assassins, these failed presidential assassins, live within two hours of an entire nation, an entire nation. They both live within two hours of CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia. Give me a fucking break. Give me a break. So anyway, he has refused to talk to the press since he got out. He lives um, and works for a group called Restoration of the Heart. This is some sort of quasi-religious organization that got him out of prison and got him a job where he's working in uh, renovation of homes or whatever he's doing there with a guy who picks him up at 5.30 in the morning to go to work. So one of the steps, and by the way, his parole ends next year. His parole ends next year. It's free and clear. One of the stipulations is that he not associate with politicians. You know, it's a good rule, right? I mean, he tried to kill four of them. Uh, didn't care what party they were in. So maybe he's got a Jones for politicians, right? So the guy who is picking him up in the morning to go to work says, you know, I'm thinking of running for the city council. Right. <laughs> so, so, so Bremer says, well, you better talk to the Secret Service because there's a rule that I can't be with a guy who's a politician. You can't make this up. So the guy goes and talks to the Secret Service saying, you know, I'm thinking of running for the city council. Is this an issue with his parole? And they go, no, we don't care. So he, not only does he run for the city council, he becomes a state senator, which is what I think he is today in the state of Maryland. This guy um, who is the handler on, on the outside of of uh, Arthur Bremer. This is the, the, the Dan Moldea of, of uh, handling of Bremer on the outside world. Picks him up at 5.30 in the morning, every day. Nobody can get to Bremer. No interviews, no questions. And the question is, where's the first half of the diary, the first 149 pages? Apparently, which I found out this week, it's ensconced under lock and key at the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, where I will attempt, with the help of Hunley and others, to get at it when we go down for the meetup in Montgomery, Alabama. I am going to try 
to get my hands on the first half of this diary, which has never been published. And I'm kind of shocked, shocked that the, the University of Alabama has kept this thing under lock and key for reasons that are inexplicable to me. Uh, I said to Eric, it, you know, one thing, if it was a private owner, um, you know, who didn't want to be bothered, but this is a public university for Christ's sakes. You know, obviously it's Alabama because his interest in the, you know, the Wallace family who believe that Bremer was part of a conspiracy to kill their father. Totally. And by the way, <clears throat> the weird thing about him getting out and everything is truthfully, sadly, there's a lot of people who are happy he did it. Yeah. Probably including that governor. He was yes, probably like, that's what I would Yeah, you did us a favor. Hey, you know, good. Yep. Let him out. And so yep. Yep. some dark, dark stuff on that side. I, I completely agree. I mean, you could make the same case for Hinckley. You're like, what is Hinckley doing out living in his mansion on a golf course where Bill Clinton has played golf and other people play golf who are Democrats? Apparently, they, there's no fear. He doesn't shoot Democrats. It says right on the sign in front of his house. I just made, <laughs> I just made that up. I just made it. They show up. By the way, the FBI shows up at uh, Joan Pemrich's house, the 15-year-old girl, right? They drag her, excuse me, Secret Service, shows up at Pemrich's house. Her parents are in the kitchen. They drag her into a bedroom for three and a half hours and inter interrogate her. They won't let the parents in. They've got automatic weapons out. The girl is in hysterics. She tells them everything she knows about Bremer, and they tell her to shut up and never speak about this for the rest of her life, which is what she's done. Uh, she was 15 at the time in in 1973 so she, i guess she's in her mid late 60s at this point and uh, they put the fear of god into her and the parents who kept saying we want to get our family attorney over here and the secret service said that's not going to happen so they literally interrogated her for three hours with automatic weapons out uh in her own bedroom in her uh house in milwaukee which is kind of scary you know yeah no kidding yeah, nobody's talking about this. And um, you, you mentioned uh, the CIA guy, right? But yeah. there was uh, another two people involved, or another dude who was involved tangentially who wound up drowned. And then um, that guy's oh, father, yeah. he wound up drowned too, right. you know, because obviously right. it's a family tradition, one well, after the other. Well, family tradition was, was a guy who had a brownstone right next to uh, Dustin Hoffman in the, in the West Village. And his last quote he said the day before he died was, if we have to have fascism to achieve our goals, then let's have fascism. And that's Ted Gold. And there Ted Gold, what's that? And there's Ted. And there's Ted Gold. They, they found Ted Gold because they found his thumb. Mm -hmm. And that's the only thing that was left of Ted Gold of the Weather Underground, uh, the weatherman at that point. Um, and you don't need a weatherman to know which way the wind blows on on west 12th street when that building blew up because that was designed to blow up government uh, offices and government buildings in new york uh, as they had done in dc and other cities across the country with bernardine dorn and bill ayers the personal ghostwriter for barack hussein obama third base and there's and Tim, there's tom hayden who will later marry jane fonder one of the founders of the sds movement um, later run for mayor of Los Angeles, a uh, real creep. Um, Abby Hoffman once, uh, once famously said of Tom Hayden, he gives opportunism a bad name. There you go. He did. Yeah. Abby did not like Tom Hayden. I, I don't blame him, but yeah. <clears throat> There's so many ties through that Marquette University yeah. and through Bremer. It, it's like literally a change into the guard because the yep. SDS turned into the weather underground yep. and he was sort of at the crossover point, almost like a well, bridge. Elements of SDS became weather underground. There were, there were some moderate elements of SDS, not that they were moderate, mm. but the, the, the days of rage was the weathermen in Chicago smashing all the windows of all the stores and the cars, which is the same as Antifa does today. So the, the weathermen in the days of rage in 1968 um, at the Chicago Convention, uh, that was the, the radical, more radical, violent spinoff of the SDS movement, and that was the the, the Weatherman, uh, named after the Dylan song, the lyric from the Dylan song. 
Fun times, fun times. Yeah. So it was. By the way, when Hunley, when Hunley, when, when Bremer, when, when Bremer was arrested, <laughs> when Bremer, you'll know why I said that. When Bremer was arrested, uh, he was reading yet another. See, they said he was an illiterate retard, right? Mm. He was reading um, Huxley's Brave New World that they found in the car um, as his current reading. I mean, who's reading books like this? He he says in his diary, he quotes uh, uh, Moby Dick. You know, I, 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 mean, I haven't even read Moby Dick. I mean, it's just really interesting how they painted this guy, um, you know, as this illiterate lone nut. And he had tons of friends in SDS. Um, he was at many of these SDS events with all his uh, different people. And I, I think, you know, what they do is they take a guy, they target him, and they take the one guy and they make him do their bidding. You know, mm -hmm. uh, whether the CIA was in on that, I don't know. Uh, Nixon and the CIA will later have a famous falling out oh, during Watergate a couple months later um, after he wins re-election. Um, I don't know. It's hard to tell who's on whose side at this point. But, I mean, Nixon may have been doing it to prevent them from smearing him. He does the same thing with Ted Kennedy at Chappaquiddick. He sends uh, the plumber's unit up to Chappaquiddick to see what's going on. Uh, because he mentions um, uh, Sirhan and he mentions the, the the Oswald thing where it may have been someone from the left, but, you know, they're trying to make it seem like he was from the right. The people like Ben Shapiro to this day believe that Oswald was a true Marxist revolutionary and uh, he was um, a communist assassin that they tried to paint as a right winger with, with uh, uh, sheep dipping to mm -hmm. smear the right. This is Ben Shapiro's belief. And it was the belief of the Nixon people, uh, unless Nixon himself knew otherwise. Uh, a bunch of them felt the same way. Well, there's this is where it gets weird. And I, I really, uh, the Tim Heinen lecture is quite fascinating. When oh, he talks it's great. about it's great. Uh, September 29th, 1968, that he carries this paper around with him, the Washington Star which puts together the financial ties to the Rockefellers, the CIA, the Weather Underground. Yep. They're all tied. Now, let me think about it. So the Weather Underground is tied to CIA. Yep. Weather Underground is tied to Obama. Obama's tied right. to- If who? I could just interject, <laughs> I think it's elements of, again, we're painting sure. with a, I don't think it's the entire organization. Like I don't think the entire FBI is in on stuff. No. It's elements within each group, people. It's not the, the group, we talk mm -hmm. in shorthand sometimes, you know, for simplicity's sake, but I, I don't think it's the entire organization each time. There's just, sometimes one hand doesn't know what the other hand is doing. You know, that doesn't mean it's not evil. I'm just saying they operate in, in different silos or funnels, Eric. You know? Well, he he brought up a great point on that. He was talking about all the Catholic um, priests who are communists, and he yeah. was like, "You're like, whoa, 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 wait, wait, that's anti-religion." He said, oh, "Hold on, it takes a lot for a Catholic priest to become a communist, but it takes very little for a communist to become a Catholic priest." I know. I love that quote. I love that quote. We should put that up on locals that uh, interview. Yeah, um, by the way, really the, the guy's name was Alan Stang. Who yes. wrote a piece? Uh, Alan Stang was a cat's name. The communist plot to kill George Wallace uh, in American Opinion magazine. If you want to find it, it's a it's a fascinating in depth look at the assassination. Is that Stang? Yes. Yeah, a fascinating look at the uh, entire Bremer Wallace uh, conundrum. And as I said, the the election at the time is dead heat at 41 41 with wallace pulling 18 percent of the vote uh he will later win multiple states uh, electoral college wise you know that's it's rare and um nixon after the assassination attempt will win the uh, election by landslide biggest um i believe it's the biggest landslide since washington's second term yep And they had a lot of money to pass around. And I think in a weird way, what we're seeing now in many of these Biden moves um, is payback for those times. And I, I, I can't explain it in detail, but the general tone I get is that uh, they, those people from that, that era who are alive today had it done to them. 
The FBI raided their offices. The mm. FBI spied on them. The Nixon administration did these things, and now they're doing them to us. And the people who are us are not aware of it, so it's shockingly insane to them that this is coming from this administration. But it did come from the Nixon administration, and it did permeate the country. Now, you could justify it by saying, as, as Liddy does in the episode we have with uh, G. Gordon Liddy that I recommend, uh, Liddy says we were at war. This was a communist takeover of the United States, and we had a fight to the death. You could say the same thing today, that we're at war with these people. Uh, this war has not stopped since Nixon. This is the same war. A Marxist takeover of the United States was attempted in 1969, 60, uh, uh, 68 to 1972 to 74. And um, I guess the Nixon administration said we got to take the gloves off. And they took the gloves off and did what they had to do, according to them. And mm -hmm. from their point of view, I completely get it. And, you know, you, when you talk to Liddy about this, when you read Will by Liddy, uh, you can see their point of view. It sounds remarkably the same to today, coming out of the Biden administration. Um, the actions that they're doing to the people on the right. Um, so this may be the pendulum swinging wildly to the other direction, Eric. Yeah, could be, but it sucks being in the middle. Uh, the guy in the pit that is cutting, <laughs> it's slicing us up. So, on that happy Me. note, yeah, we do have uh, some super chats to close us out. Um, Kirk Bur Burkhalter, Wallace got 85% of the black vote in the last governor's race. He, he's more complicated yeah, he than peace. people realize. Yeah, he made peace, so did his wife. His wife got a lot of the black vote when she ran for governor. Uh, it's not a, It's not how the left paints it. Uh, the you can watch all the PBS documentaries and Gary Sinise, George Wallace, John Frankenheimer movies you want. It's uh, far more complicated and regional than uh, PBS will uh, let you uh, decide for yourself. Yeah, Barnes Barnes talks about Wallace from time to time and is definitely um, very interested because Wallace is a true populist. And I think that's Barnes' interest. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, Mark needs a technology improvement fund. We're working on it. We're working on it, folks. I don't know what's going on. Uh, between bandwidth, what are you going to do? Uh, Donnie Girl, Aloha from Hawaii. Aloha. Wow. <laughs> Here we go again. To the Portable Wi-Fi Repeater Fund. That's a fun fund. <laughs> and we have John S. with a 10, a 10 pound super sticker. Thank you very much. Get a lot of support from Germany and England lately. Uh, England is our number two market. What? Well, at least they speak two. English. Uh, there is that. Believe it or not, they're above Canada, though. Uh, Glenn Bush, super sticker. Thank you very much. And Mo Bishop, like and share, people. Yes, please. Please, please, please like and share. And guys, we're creeping up um, eventually to... Uh, what? We're going to get 100,000 someday. Everybody could make that move a little bit quicker. Uh, remember to subscribe. Mark's probably got a bell somewhere. And what? it will help a lot. We're almost to 95,000. So we're kind of oh my God. away. It's getting crazy, Hunley. No kidding. Um, Pasha, it feels somewhat ironic to me that Nixon tried to plant evidence that Bremer was a leftist when Bremer was a leftist. Should have been an right. easy okay. sell. Let me, let me just stop and say again that he was doing it to prevent them from uh, uh, tagging him quickly as a right-wing nut. He's and trying to get Nixon ahead of the says story. That, he says that in the audio tapes. He's, yeah. This is not me theorizing this. This is Nixon saying it. We've got to get that out there before they jump on us. And he says, you know how fast they do this with the left-wing media. Mm -hmm. And he says, we got to get somebody up there. Now, Colson and Hunt both deny they ever went there. But that doesn't make it untrue. I mean, Hunt was a professional liar, and Coulson went to prison, I mean, to put it mildly. Uh, but th that's on the tape of what Nixon is ordering them to do for that reason, to prevent the being smeared with the uh, same brush. Interesting. Uh, Silvhand sent a $30 tip in Locals. Um, question, since RFK Jr. pulls votes and money from Trump, and this is obvious, yet 
he insists on running anyway. Is he deliberately sinister? The attacks on him could have been a plot to make Trump voters like him more so that more of them go to him. Um, that's probably a Friday topic. Well, I just want to say <laughs> something, right? I just want to say, first of all, he, he didn't denounce the last indictments against Trump. He didn't denounce these indictments against Trump that happened yesterday out of Atlanta. Um, he may be controlled opposition and not know that he's controlled opposition. They may be, there may be people around him feeding into his own narcissistic personality that causes him to run now as opposed in 2028, where he would have an open field and not be divisive, causing the re-election of Joe Biden, no matter how much you like his policies. The endorsement of RFK Jr. leads to the re-election of Joe Biden. If you've learned anything from this channel, what we talk about is pragmatic, concrete, real politics. The real politics of RFK Jr.'s run is the end game is the re-election of Joe Biden. Now, whether it's intentional or not is irrelevant to me. I don't give a shit why he's running. He says he's running to win and that his wife wouldn't let him run unless he was winning. There's no way to win the freaking nomination. All he's doing is taking money from Trump, taking airtime from Trump, taking news articles from Trump, Every single negative thing he does on a daily basis affects one man negatively. Well, I don't like Trump. Well, go fuck yourselves. Either do I. The reality of it is there's two candidates. There's only two. There's not RFK Jr. and Newsom and Mel Torme and DeSantis. There's two guys. One of them or both of them may end up in prison. But again, it's just two guys, Eric. And, and unless there's some way that I don't know about for RFK Jr. to win the nomination for the Democratic Party of a party that hates his guts, that tried to pull him out of a room in an open congressional hearing three weeks ago, uh, it's a joke. And the ugly joke is that the Biden administration is encouraging RFK Jr.'s campaign for one reason. He's hauling in millions and millions and millions of dollars of Trump donors, independent donors, and populist donors who are giving this guy money that is going to end up going nowhere when he's swinging in a gym outside on, on uh, hooks on Venice Muscle Beach after he pulls out of the uh, failed election attempt. And that, that, I mean, that's just the reality of it. Whether you agree with it or not is irrelevant. It's irrelevant. Whether you don't like Trump or not is irrelevant. If you stay out and don't vote, you're electing Joe Biden. That's your, you have to go to bed at night with your head on your pillow saying, I didn't like Trump. Okay, I didn't vote. You elected Joe Biden. Thank you very much, St. Louis, Missouri. Thank you in Kansas. Thank you in Florida for helping us defeat Joe Biden. Because the cowardice is breathtaking. Your morality is not going to help us. You're looking for the perfect candidate is not going to help us. It's down to two people and the republic is on the line. So tell me about the incredible programs of RFK Jr. you'd like to see this year and how they're going to get implemented when Joe Biden is back in for four more repressive years of an administration, how that worked out for you, okay? When the, when the IRS, 87,000 guys with guns, come for you, who is going to defend you? Because nobody's going to be left, bro. Nobody's going to be left because you wanted the perfect candidate and you stayed out of the race or voted for some third-party candidate uh, or wrote in somebody's name like Tim Scott. Thank you very much for your help. All right. Well, Grapes sent a $5 tip saying, great show. Thanks. And Bighorn Shaver says, Biden has already checked out. His wife told him he isn't running while they're on vacation. That's funny. <laughs> um, well, I mean, he hasn't even helped or acknowledged Hawaii, has he, Eric? No. Hey, hey, hey. I mean, Trump, to his credit, would have been on the ground throwing paper towels to people. Oh, for sure. And uh, and be giving out Trump um, bottled water. Um, Rick time with a $5 super chat. Wait, I, I've Rumor? never heard that he spoke, I never heard that he spoke Russian. If okay, that's true, you're going to have to show me a source of that. That would be crazy if he did. Yeah. Uh, Mo Bishop, Dems in Alabama have been buying the black vote for eons. Okay. And what does that mean? That they, they each 85% of the vote, they gave them $5 each. Every every black man is retarded and couldn't vote his own conscience. That's really racist. <laughs> it's kind of what 
what what Wallace says on Buckley's show, which I strongly recommend, the firing line with William F. Buckley. He kind of calls him on all these uh, different uh, racial ideas that Buckley has. Okay, uh, Sultron Barnes described Wallace and DeSantis as pragmatists. I don't know how is DeSantis a pragmatist. I mean, he's he, he's the most unpragmatic candidate I've ever seen in my life. DeSantis is single as a as a governor he was. I don't know oh, what he's doing oh, as, as president. But, but, oh, I'm sorry, I thought you meant running and, for president. But like, yeah, Wallace. as governor, yeah, they yeah yeah yeah. Fair. You're right. You're right. You're um, right. Pasha, cool. Mark, I agree regarding Nixon just noting the irony. Oh, yes. Irony is fun. We all love irony. Fitz <laughs> uh, Nimitz, love hearing stories about my state. I hope we'll see you in your state. Um, you find Which a lot state? of people oh, down oh. here who are Alabama. Yeah. very opinionated about Wallace. Looking forward to seeing you all down here. All right. Right. Excellent. I mean, look, I mean, the reason I got into Wallace was twofold. One was the Curtis LeMay story. And the second one is we're going to Alabama. So uh, I want to find stories that are related to Alabama for the meetup uh, Labor Day weekend. And I said, why not start with this one? Nothing could be more controversial than George Wallace. Right, Again, yeah. I'm not endorsing his politics. Uh, well, I, I, know I guess you have to say it a hundred times, but yeah. you have to just keep saying it. it's kind of like Matt Taibbi. Uh, yes, that's I, the first thing I, thought. <laughs> I, I am not endorsing Trump. I am Matt Taibbi. All right, um, Basil Beshkov coming in hot. Keep repeating this. Love your direct and succinct wisdom. Hundred dollars, man. You love Dude, it a I'm lot. I'm exhausted from repeating this. I need I need these super chats every week to keep repeating this. Because <laughs> well, I'm running out of that's gas. That's a start. That's a start. Thank you. Thank you very much. He's funding your own Dude, campaign. You got to get this through your fat heads already. Jesus Christ. There's other things. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, back to locals. Al Parks sent a five dollar tip. I thought Mark was joking when he said the Aussie Prime Minister Harold Holt was knocked off by U.S. intelligence. I went down the rabbit hole and wow, I'm finding a series of dots. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, I, I, I can't prove it, uh, but the dots are there. I, I didn't just pull that out of my ass. I mean, the, the, the Holt dots are there. I, I mean, I alleged that he offended LBJ uh, because of the lack of protection that LBJ received when he came to Australia and his car was pelted with eggs and paint. That's enough to well be Jay to kill a man. And you know, he probably I mean, drank like, him under the table too, or it could hold up with him, and that right, pissed him off too. Right. He, <laughs> he did drink heavily with LBJ, but I'm saying it may have been that trip. I think in 1967, where he visits Australia, and mm -hmm. he's met with hordes of anti-war protesters that pelted the car. And I I know this would have infuriated LBJ uh, simply by not providing the protection that was necessary for that. A death mobile, which which it was, it was the Kennedy death mobile, uh, to uh, go through Australia unmolested. Uh, there, there's some famous photos of that. That's the um, the LBJ vehicle being pelted with um, eggs and paint and and milk and everything else by the demonstrators. You see the Secret Service agent on the left, uh, completely covered in paint. This is enough for LBJ to kill a man. I can tell you that right now. And uh, Holt may have uh, signed his own death warrant. Now, I don't know if Holt is involved in this or let it happen, or it's just a failure of security. Uh, but let me tell you something. That's enough for LBJ to uh, kill a man. Just scary. Um, Bighorn Shaver says, LOL, Trump will be throwing lays in Hawaii. I don't know about lays, but at least he'd be there is the point of the matter. Right. At least he'd be on the ground like he was in Puerto Rico. New World also saying, Soul is saying, how about a show on Phoenix City, Alabama? I, I don't know what, what is going on in Phoenix City. I watched Asteroid City, by the way, this week uh, by, by, by Wes Anderson, not to be confused with Wes Craven. Um, what a piece of shit movie. I mean, it, it, the guy made a couple of good movies and it's just one oddball thing after another from this cat. Like I couldn't even make it through and I'm an art film kind of guy. I mean, hmm. oh my God. Then I try to watch Babylon. I mean, it was a double bill in my house. Uh, two unwatchable films, total probably six hours of cinema. Uh, holy cow, two directors gone off the rails. <laughs> right. Um, Al Parks uh, said LBJ did turn up to Holt's funeral, by the way. That was nice of him. He probably wanted to make sure he was dead. I, what I remember is he held a mirror up to his nose in the coffin. <laughs> was he smoking a cigar at the time? No, no, he just wanted to see if he was breathing. I don't know if Holt was alive or dead. 
Did they did find his body though? I I never remember if they found no, his body. No, I, I thought they didn't find it. I, right, I so it must have been like a ceremonial funeral. I guess, I guess so. Uh, B stats or Pats with a super sticker. Thank you very much. And Fibro Warrior with a super sticker as well. Thank you very much. And on that note, what do we have coming up? Freeform Friday, right? Right. Free, what's what, yeah? We got Freeform Friday. We're going to talk about these indictments um, again. We're going to talk about the new indictments in Atlanta. You know the 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 Willis woman, not to be confused with Mickey Willis. This is Fannie Willis, mm -hmm. uh, the district attorney of Atlanta. Like Trump, like uh, Barnes pointed out, the guy goes through two impeachments. You're cleared. You can't have crackpot county prosecutors putting the president on trial all over a country. This is never going to work, people. That's why you have an impeachment process. That's where you have the conviction or, or, or non-conviction of a president. You can't clear the president through two failed impeachments and then just indict him in every single county in the country. Just think about it. Even if you hate the guy's guts, this is an unworkable, illegal scenario. Uh, Willis's father is a great guy. Uh, like I said on Twitter, he wasn't a member of the Democratic Party. He wasn't a member of the Republican Party. He was a member of the Black Panther Party. That's who this chick is. Her By father way, who was hung a out, who, was, who hung out with the same people we we're talking about here with Bremer. Yeah, but I'm just saying <laughs> this is who is in power now. We have a mayor here in L.A. who is a former Black Panther. We have a prosecutor in Atlanta whose father was a Black Panther. You can't make this stuff up, folks. This is who we're dealing with now. These people did not die despite Hoover trying to eradicate them all. Uh, through his COINTELPRO programs, uh, they are here, they're alive, they have weaseled their way into power with the likes of George Soros and the money from him and his son, and they have created a maelstrom of malcontents from here to, to Atlanta who want to damage and incarcerate people. Now, this, this thing in Atlanta reeks of Obama, this reeks of Valerie Jarrett, this reeks of Chicago hardball jail politics. Only people in Chicago like Obama use jail as a weapon. This is a type of, of operation that Blagojevich can talk about, that Jesse Jackson Jr. can talk about. It. Regular politicians don't do this. Nixon didn't jail people who were his opponents. Nobody does until you get to Obama and Chicago style politics. That's who this chick is and I believe that Obama is indirectly running this show out of Fulton County in Atlanta. That's true, but to get ready yeah. for Friday, I have my emotional support animal, Oswald, who will be here and help me get through the week as I read headlines that get ever more <coughs> distressing every day. Dude, it gets it darker is. every day. I mean, <laughs> I, it's just shocking. I, I just, it's hard to sleep. I mean, this is just crazy, Huntley. I don't know where this ends or how it ends. I mean, it's just. Oy, oy, oy. Oy, oy, oy. I don't know, but everybody check us out on locals. We've still got some tickets available for a oh, yeah. meetup in Alabama. Wait, but not the VIP one, just the meetup. Uh, Correct. The, the main meetup. Yeah. The, the main one. Yeah. Yeah. OK, but, so the main one has tickets available for Sunday night. Sunday night. Okay. Labor Day uh, weekend in Alabama, um, seventy-five dollars a head outside. Mm -hmm. But if you're a local supporter, it's only fifty dollars. Okay, that's fair. Pretty sizable discount on that. Oh. Hope to see uh, more folks there. VIP already sold out. That's been sold out now for a while. Wow. And uh, you could find info at ericunley.eventbrite.com. Eventbrite. And if you're on locals, there's a post on locals that has a nice discount coupon yeah. for people who are supporting and this is where the book fund money goes to buying rare life magazines also folks so if you want to donate um maybe someday we can afford to get the actual arthur bremer diary book which there i think go. is about three or four hundred dollars on on uh on amazon but, but i will put a pdf of the arthur yeah, bremer could, diary book on locals, locals members. yeah i will do that tonight for um folks to check out there and on okay. that note, we'll see okay. everybody Friday. Okay.